Well, let's get on to, obviously, during these weird times, we've talked about doing some stuff together. We were kind of planning on doing right. some stuff together until this this pestilence came. And uh, so, you know, one of the things I've been talking about in these interviews is like, you know, no one really knows what's going on or how long this thing is going to last and so on and so forth. But you kind of make the best of what you can. And I know you've been doing your pretty much daily uh, broadcasts on live streams, if you will, on Facebook. So what are your thoughts about this point in time? What are you hearing about, you know, when things are going to, I know you did that uh, kind of drive-in situation at that club up by you. Uh, what's kind of the, the future as you know it at this point in time? Well, I did do the drive-in experience up at Tupelo Music Hall, and that was great. It was a, it was a great day all around. It was a good payday. Everything was really good. And the streams I'm doing, and, you know, trying to collect tips and trying to sell merch and all that other stuff to keep busy. Um, but, you know, like I, I've had some ske scheduled shows be rescheduled now for the third time in September. I'm supposed to go to Dallas, excuse me, Tulsa, McKinney, Houston, and Kansas City. I open up the news today, hot spots, all of a right. sudden a re-spike. You know, yeah. it's like, I, you know, I don't feel too good about getting on a plane in September, you right. know? And, and I, so I, I don't really know, you know, uh, I got another stream I'm planning with, uh, someone to promote it to, uh, a paid stream. We'll see what happens. I mean, my live streams daily are, they're just free events. If everybody, if anybody wants to contribute to a tip job, that's great. If they don't, that's okay too. Right. But a lot of it is like this. It's just rap sessions with, I might play a couple songs and demonstrate, but it's not like a music thing where I play a, sh a set every day. I don't do that at all. Right. It's more really like a, a therapy session, you know, a morning therapy session or a venting <laughs> session. You know, I can talk about how the insurance company screwed me or how the, <laughs> right. the water bill is through the roof. Uh, you know. <laughs> but it's been good, you know, I, but I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think it's going to be the same. Um, because I got a feeling between regulations and between people's fear factor right. about going out and being cautious about contracting something, it's going to be tough. And for guys that are, I don't even know how anybody in a band, I mean, I'm lucky that I figured out a Rubik's cube of doing something solo because having a band or even a trio right now, I mean, if, if, if promoters are doing things that, 50% capacity, 25% capacity. How's somebody from the East Coast going to be able to expense themselves to go to the right. Midwest, the West Coast, when all the promoters are going to cut the guarantees? It's not going to be, you know, if you went somewhere for X amount of dollars last year, right. it's going to be, you know, divided that divide that by, you know, 70%. You know, and that's the type of office that I'm getting. And it's like, I say to my agent, I can't go to Seattle for that. Right. Exactly. It's and it's just me and it's by myself, right. you know? That's crazy. So, and I think it's gonna be all the way down the line. I mean, big acts, it's gonna be tough for big acts. And because how are you gonna get a, an act like you know our friend Dave Amaro that they, they do sheds? Right. Uh, you know, you can't have a hundred percent capacity in sheds. Right. And they got a big, you know, they got a big uh production that they bring around two semis or you know, someone like Joe, you know, goes out and he's always selling out. And what if he has to do 50% capacity or 35% capacities? That's not going to be tough. Exactly. It's going to be tough. It'll be interesting to see what happens. I think that the um, some kind of pay-per-view live stream conjunction with a live show, you know, might be the norm. Right. Right. Exactly. You got to do what you got to do by Jiminy Jangle Jingle. It's, and I know uh, you, I mean, luckily you can... I've been, I've been quarantined with my son on drums. So there's <laughs> at least, at least we have uh, two thirds of the band here. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely strange times. Well, enough about that crazy stuff. Let's talk about fun stuff like guitars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, now your signature model Gibson is uh, it's a delicious specimen. And there's a lot of uh, kind of cool historical significance of the fact that that thing really, if we're honest about it, is the first kind of unique uh, variation 
um, of what Gibson has done as, as opposed to just kind of a tweaked this or that. It's kind of its own unique um, vessel, if you will. The first time probably since, I don't know, you could probably speak to it better than I could as far as the the historicity of of when it came out versus the it's kind of the classic kind of variation, especially of some of the jazz players, you know, from uh, you know, Tal Farlow or who, so on and so forth, from the guys from the from the late '50s, early '60s, and so on and so forth. So tell us how that all came about, and and um, and how much you were involved. I know you were very involved with the specifics of how that thing came about. Just kind of tell us how it all came about and why you came up with the design that you came up with. Okay. Well, <clears throat> first of all, it is probably the, the first time that was a ground up signature model for an artist that was unique. Probably since the sixties, it's, right. it's probably like, maybe like, you know, it could have been the Birdland might have been the last one that, you know, that was had really unique qualities, you know, with the, you know, the Birdland being a very rare commodity in that line being a 23.75 scale line. I think it's the only Gibson in the line that did that. I mean, there could have been a 330 that was at that scale at one point. I'm not sure. I think three, the ES330 had a couple different scale lengths. Right. But the way that happened was <clears throat> when I got signed, uh, and then the, the record got picked up and I was looking to try to create the sound, this instrumental guitar thing without a singer. I was looking for a sound and I knew I wanted a Bigsby tailpiece because I had an old Gretsch that my dad had bought for me in 1967. But I didn't want to use a Gretsch because, you know, Brian Setzer, he's got that Gretsch thing down. You know, it's right. just he, he just plays it great. It's just so identifiable with him. I knew I didn't want to use a Strat because so many people at the time, Stevie Ray Vaughan, I mean, everybody was just, it was Strat Central. So I remember just kind of perusing the music stores and I came across this ES-295. Right. And I picked it up and I said, oh, this sounds really nice. I bought the guitar, uh, I took it home and I was, uh, I put flat long strings on it. And about 70% of that first album was recorded with an ES-295 and flat long strings. And I used some Firebirds and, 335s, Les Pauls, L5s, and different, a lot of different Gibsons. Um, <clears throat> and then when I started touring behind that album, I used three guitarists to, to, to get through all the songs and the material on that record. I used a 335, I used a 295, and I used a Les Paul, all with Bigsby's. I don't like changing guitars. I just don't like the ergonomics of changing guitars. You know, you got that, you got this thing here. You know, you got the 295, and it's a, 16 inch body and it's this deep with a neck set here so here's your f here but right. when you take a, a a 335 my f is out here somewhere and you take a les paul and it's a and it's a 13 inch body and it sits lower on you so now you're hunched over the guitar so i just didn't like that so i went to a summer nam <clears throat> and um rick gembar who you know i know yeah. you know i just they started to make me 59 Les Pauls with Bigsby's uh, reissues, R9s, which they didn't make. They weren't making Bigsby R9s at the time. So I got three of them, and I was using those exclusively for a while. And then when I went to a summer name in 2002, Rick asked me how I liked how Les Pauls working out. And I said, uh, you know, they're great. I can't really fault that design. It's just a, it's a classic guitar. It sounds great, but I'm missing the hollow tone for my 295. I wish there was something that could kind of give me the ability, the versatility of a Les Paul, but a little bit of the hollow tone. So there was this like prototype throwaway guitar that was sitting around that I just bonded to. It was kind of like the prototype of what my guitar was, but it wasn't quite there yet, you know, but it was, it had a, a really good soul to it. So um, he said, well, we'd be interested in doing something because at that time I was selling a lot of records and I had a number one song and it was in the guitar magazines. And I think Gibson liked the idea of someone using their guitar that was the voice of, of the guitar instead of being a guitar player behind the singer. It right. was like, it was a guitarist as a vocalist, like in the spirit of the guys like Tal and Chet and Les and, you know, a guy doing popular songs, you know, songs, not riffing and using the guitar as the voice. Right. So they said they wanted to work with me on a design. So uh, it started with this throwaway prototype. And uh, I said, well, 
a thin line hollow body with a 25 and a half inch scale with an ebony board to try to get, I was trying to get the tone of the 295. I mean, now right. granted that's a 24 and three quarter inch scale with P90s and a rosewood board, but I didn't want to use P90s because of the noise. So I wanted to use humbucking, which I knew immediately I would not get that same kind of attack from a humbucker that you would get from a P90. So we said, well, let's change the fingerboard to ebony. Even though I prefer rosebud, uh, rose, rosewood, <laughs> um, I knew the ebony would give me the attack. And we just made it hollow. And uh, we, uh, we changed the next set from uh, like on a 335. The next set's at the 19th fret little too far out for me we had it set at the 18th fret and uh and that's really how it came about and i made some tweaks to the the dish of the guitar the carve and basically i work with matthew klein down there i was down there every week i was there two days three days a week for a long long time working on that guitar with them as a matter of fact they had mike mcguire who i know you know oh yeah said to me no one's ever worked on their guitar on their signature model like i did i was interested in a lot of different aspects of it i wanted to make it a modern player's guitar but still have features that would harken back to the golden era of a guitar that might have came out in 1960 or 61 right you know you know and uh it does i mean if you look at the the aesthetics of it you know, the, the way that the binding is the multiple ply binding, it's in, it's in historically accurate with what a Gibson would be. If you've got five ply in the front, you got three ply on the back. Right. If you got three ply in the back, you got one, ply. you know, that's the way they did things. <clears throat> and, um, the dish, I said, I want this to look like a fifties Les Paul type of dish. So we basically took a Les Paul, a real Les Paul and extrapolated the dish on a computer and don't just stretch it out because that would flatten the dish. You had to do all the math to make the dish feel like it was because the guitar is a 14 and an eighth inch body, my guitar, not a 13 inch body. Got so it. it was things like that. Change the cutaway shape to make them more traditional Florentine cutaways. Uh, the neck profile, the original, I know it says Johnny A profile, but the neck profile was based on a very good friend of mine's 59 Les Paul where you know a lot of those reissues back then they had these big chunky necks with you play a real 59 a lot of them aren't really like that a lot right. of them have a little bit of a flatter back more of a d than a c shape and that's what the original johnny a profile was based on 